Okay, so I think we're going to get started with today's session. Um, a very warm welcome indeed. Uh, this is one actually in a series of events that Nesta's been hosting with writers, artists and change makers, all of whom are challenging assumptions about the future and who gets to shape it. Uh, my name is Celia Hannon and I've uh, the pleasure really of being your guide today as we embark on this whistle-stop tour of Mackenzie's ideas. Um, at Nesta, I'm Director of Explorations, um, so we're a team really just focused on using the tools of foresight to look for new ways to tackle tomorrow's challenges. So before I introduce Mackenzie, I'd like to explain a bit about the format of the session. So uh, she and I will kick things off with a chat for the first 30 minutes or so, um, and then we'll actually open up to your questions and your comments. And I'd really like to encourage you just to put the questions into the chat uh, box from the very beginning. So there's really no need to wait until we finish talking later. And the caliber of the questions for this series of events has been really excellent. So I'm, I'm pretty sure we're gonna be spoiled for choice. Now, if you've um, read much of Mackenzie's work, you'll know that we're in the uh, company of something of a, of a polymath, really. Um, so you can expect a very wide ranging conversation. I hope you've uh, brushed up on your marks over breakfast. So by way of a brief introduction, I'll just say that um, Mackenzie is a professor of media and cultural studies at the New School in New York. And books like A Hacker Manifesto and Gamer Theory, she's shown this kind of uncanny knack of peering over into the horizon to see uh, what the information age has in store for us next. Um, more recently in Capital is Dead, she counters this kind of widely held view that capitalism is just morphing into new forms like surveillance capitalism or platform capitalism uh, and I'll argues it's actually being replaced by something which has even more sinister implications. So I hope we'll have time to touch on some of the ideas in that book um, but the volume we're here to talk about today is one which Mackenzie has just published with Verso and it's called Sensoria. So in the book, Mackenzie um, really weaves together the, the work of about, um, I think it's 19 different contemporary writers. So uh, they're from diverse disciplines that you'd actually rarely see grouped together all in one place. But in fact, that's actually almost the, the organising principle. So Mackenzie's arguing that it's really absurd for any discipline to claim sovereignty only over the others. So it's, it's kind of in the spaces between things that the magic happens. So Mackenzie, welcome. I think you, um, in the book, you use the well-known parable of, of the elephant uh, to, to make this point. Can you, can you start there for us today, perhaps? Thank you, Celia, and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, so I wanted to tell a version of the, it's usually told as uh, the blind men and the elephant parable, but I wanted to do a version that wasn't sort of ableist or just about men. So it's the uh, differently abled people and the elephant, because uh, it's maybe the one who can't see doesn't understand the elephant better than the other ones. So but maybe knowledge production is, if you like, you know, different experiences of a thing where you only uh, perceive part of it. So... Uh, one scholar grasps that the elephant is gray and another one grasps that it's wrinkly and another one. So, you know, how do we put those things together? And, and the thing is, you sort of don't. Like when you add the different fields of knowledge, it doesn't actually add up to an elephant because they're sort of somewhat different perceptions. So it, it seems to me integration and coordination of forms of knowledge is really one of the big problems of the 21st century given that we're not going to really get out of this century unless we figure that out. Yeah? How do you combine forms of knowledge and apply them uh, to sort of, you know, making the world inhabitable? Uh, so I, I kind of wanted to, uh, you know, sort of start with that image that, you know, uh, uh, let's not pretend there's any one form of knowledge that knows, you know, what the elephant in the room is. The elephant in the room being capitalism is going to kill us all or it's climate change or, or whatever, but... Uh, let's get working on figuring out how to connect those things together. 
Thank you. And it's, uh, it was so rare and refreshing to see, um, you know, an academic not claiming uh, that, that, that their discipline has got all the answers from the outset of a, of a new book. That's pretty rare. Um, it's implied, I guess, uh, in the book and, and maybe your writings generally that you think that kind of scholarship and the academy is um, really needs to start working harder when it comes to proving its value, that the noise of its critics is getting louder or harder to ignore. Um, can you say a little bit more about that and, and maybe the state of play in the US where you teach? Yeah, I think we're, we're at a point where any sort of fairly reliable way of producing knowledge about something real in the world will tell you at the moment that the world is in a very, very bad state uh, uh, and that things really can't go on like this. So if you're a ruling class with a vested interest in the power you have over things going on like this, then you know the idea dawns that we'll have to stop knowledge of it. And that seems to be where we are, that you know, it's become uh, dangerous to, to teach about climate change, for example, uh, or in, in the United States, you know, the truly astonishing levels of mass incarceration and, and policing that uh, particularly people of colour and black people are subjected to here, to even just, you know, sort of be honest about these things is kind of crazy and absurd, uh, is, is becoming a problem. So one has to defend the space where you would even generate knowledge about these things. Uh, but at a time where in the United States and in, in the UK, we kind of just made knowledge another commodity uh, where it's kind of like buying a house or a car. You, you buy a degree, you know, uh, with which to buy the other ones. So we sort of completely undermine uh, any notion of it being a social good. Uh, so it gets very, very hard to defend it because it's like, I don't want to defend that. I don't want people to go into thousands of dollars of debt just to become, you know, knowledgeable humans is kind of ridiculous. So I, you're sort of fighting this on two fronts where on the one hand, it's like, like that's crazy. Well, I don't, you know, and I, like I, I hate to have to say this, but when I went to university, it was basically free. It was $400 a year and we complained about that, you know, that it meant you were free to study what you wanted. It still wasn't equal. It was still really hard for working class kids to get there, but at least you didn't put this massive extra burden on making it a thing you could strive for. So you have to defend education on two fronts, that it really should be a social good and it really ought to be about production of knowledge for use rather than for, you know, uh, uh, I mean, whatever. I don't know what uh, uh, some branches of the university now think they're doing. And it's interesting, you kind of talk about the commodification of, of uh, an, a degree. Um, the book, which I suppose in some ways was a bit of a precursor to this one, General Intellects, is about the idea that actually um, the, the role of the public intellectual, as it once was, has been, um, I suppose, skewed or distorted by the commodification of knowledge in the public sphere. Um, and I just wondered if you could kind of talk about the link between that book and this one. So this is almost a kind of follow up to that. And you, I think you talk about wanting to get out the West a bit in terms of some of the thinkers and, and writers that you were looking at this one. Yeah, so I, Sensoria is the, the second of two books I've done that are about other people's work. Uh, and the discipline was to try to write only 4,000 words on one particular aspect of, of somebody's work uh, and just sort of then organize those and group them together in book form. And uh, they're not sort of random book reviews or anything like I, none of them are commissions or maybe one was. They're things I chose to read to try to figure out what's going on in other branches of knowledge. Uh, and, and when I did General Intellects, uh, one of the constraints was like half the authors have to not be men. Uh, one, one, of, one of my authors changed, changed genders in the middle of it, but, so the, but I think that not be cis men was the criteria. For, but it was a little, little Eurocentric and people called me out about that. And I thought, all right, so I'm gonna do another collection of pieces about other people, which is Sensoria. And it's how do I get out of my sort of New York centered world here? So it's not like I'm gonna arrive at global knowledge. Like no one gets to be Hegel anymore. Like there isn't a synthesis. That's the point of the, the parable of the elephant. Yeah, like we don't end up with the, the synthetic elephant in the room, um, but you can sort of start to perceive how your worldview is local, even though your worldview is attempting some sort of uh, synthesis of what's going on in the world. There are other ones 
and where do we get those other perspectives? Um, so yeah, there's, there's kind of like a bit of an attempt to what does it look like, you know, uh, uh, from the point of view of China, I have a chapter on, uh, Wang Hui, who, uh, is a kind of, um, uh, sometimes called from the new left in China. He disputes that, that claim. Uh, and it's like, wow, like world history is really different if you sort of perceive it from that point of view. And, and I think as a Westerner, that's a point of view you really need to have some anchor on, given that if there's a center to world history at the moment, it's what happens to the PRC, right? Um, so yeah, that was sort of the project for this. And the caveat is I'm not an expert on any of these things. I'm, I'm reading things in other fields. So it's to not claim some universal authority on this. I'm not trying to judge these authors. I'm trying to learn from them. Um, so it's perhaps fitting that we talk about a white male American uh, writer first from your book. Uh, terrible choice on my part, but um, I, just so the audience know where we're going, um, we're just going to pick out two or three examples, depending on how much time we have, um, from, from the thinkers that Mackenzie uh, looks at. Um, and uh, just to give you a little bit of a flavour of some of the ideas that are in the book. So I did think it'd be interesting to start with someone that a lot of the audience has likely heard of, so Cory Doctorow, um, and the ideas, I guess, that he specifically looks at in Information Doesn't Want to Be Free, because that's kind of the focus of, of what you're looking at there. Um, what is it that you think Corey's work has to offer us as we start to try to understand the kind of uh, economic dy dynamics that operate between, um, you know, creators and intermediaries in, in digital culture? Yeah, well, Corey is a Canadian rather than. Oh, okay. Than, I think he would. He would want oh, me to take offence at that. Yeah. <laughs> but like me from the Commonwealth. Yes. <laughs> uh, and most of the people in the book are academics, but some are not. And it seems to me it's interesting to look at that sort of organic production of knowledge that can happen outside the university in terms of how people uh, work. It, for example, in Corey's case, you know, has this long history, uh, both as a fiction writer, but also as someone. Uh, who worked for Boing Boing, which was in the era of the blogs. That was one of the you know, most popular blogs in the world. Uh, and has this, I think, really good take on what it means to be uh, a knowledge or creative producer in the 21st century, where you're kind of navigating between um, two chunks of the ruling class, you know, like one of which wants to uh, own your content and the other wants to own like the pipe, you know, the form through which whatever you produce gets distributed. And those two are constantly at war with each other. Uh, and the fact that your computer that you're seeing this on is like full of spyware and just, you know, reporting your data to like dozens of companies you never heard of uh, and is updating itself without your permission, uh, you know, constantly, most likely, you know, that's all the product of those two chunks of the ruling class fighting over who gets to control information. Uh, and Corey was trying to think through, well, you can't change that, but what are strategies for being an artist or a writer or whatever in that space? And like what's, without like picking sides between them doesn't really help. So for example, being like really protective about your copyrights, you're really just advocating for the people who try to own content. That's not really necessarily in your interests. Not that you want to give everything away for free, but you know, like Corey makes this good argument. Like, like sometimes creating your audience is more important than owning the thing, you know? So you have to sort of navigate that, you know, so on and so forth. So I don't want to get into too much of the detail of it, but to sort of think, you know, the next thing with that is how do all of us who are in this position of not owning, you know, uh, massive chunks of the internet, you know, I, I'm not Google, I'm not Apple. Uh, what's our common interest? How do I as a writer or, you know, people who are scientists, people who are musicians, it doesn't matter if you're in the business of creating uh, information, if that's your job, how do we see all of our interests as connected uh, in trying to resist this commodification of information? And, and that, that leads us into, um, I think, the, uh, the sort of distinction that you make in, um, in your book, Capital is Dead, which uh, looks at the, the way that the information age has kind of created this new set of factions or class interests. So you've got a slightly different take on it to Corey in that you, you talk about the hacker class and the vectorist class and I think hacker might mean something slightly different in your your reading of it so I wondered if you could just explain to people what those two classes are so they know where they fit <laughs> yeah and it, and it's 
it's sort of the, the theme of um, Capital is Dead is like, what if this isn't even capitalism anymore? It's something worse. You know, like how would, how would we develop concepts that articulate that experience? Does the commodification of information represent kind of a new stage in the same way that, you know, capitalism builds on a commodification of land that, that sort of precedes it. Uh, and it's kind of different, like the landlord class extracts value in a slightly different way to what capitalism does. And, you know, Adam Smith is trying to grapple with that, and particularly David Ricardo, you know, these people that Marx was reading. So, you know, landlords and farmers are still there, capital and worker is still there, but what, was, what if there was a new sort of class conflict over information on top of the other two and extracting value and controlling the value chain through all of that? And I called that new ruling class vectoralist in the sense that, you know, what does it mean to, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, control everything through owning not just information, but the vector that connects it all together. Yeah, a vector is a line of fixed length, but no fixed position. It's a nice way to think of the internet that's joining us all together at the moment, that Zoom is apparently making money off somehow, you know, or, or its stock value is sort of massively increased, right? So, yeah, like, it's, and if you look at who the dominant companies are today, that seems to be what they do. Yeah, like Apple doesn't make phones, like you outsource that sort of stuff. Um, what actual product does Google give you? Like basically nothing. It's all in the information control business. So I go to Google to get a little piece of information, but Google gets all of the information that all of us produce. So that's the asymmetry that, that seems to me to be built on top of exploitation of labor and exploitation of land. And then, well, maybe, you know, this comes back to that, what's the common interest of all of those of us who produce information? I, I tried to call us, you know, the hacker class. Um, maybe it's a little dated as a term. It's, it's a very criminalized term these days. Mm -hmm. And I meant not just people who work with computers, but anybody who produces information that somebody else gets the value of. We have a class interest together. Like maybe you could call it digital labor. It would be another way to think of it. And it's a little different analog labor. Uh, but what is our common interest and how do we articulate a class interest? That's the thing I've been trying to really argue now for 20 years. <laughs> and and it's, it's interesting because you, you know, the, there is this problem in a way that um, with factory workers, it's it's perhaps easy to look and say, okay, you have a common interest, you're, you're doing, you know, the same set of repetitive tasks. Uh, we can see who the owner of that factory is. But, you know, one of the problems, of course, that you talk about with um, the hacker class is that, actually it's not often very obvious that we might have common class interests with each other because the work kind of looks quite different and people that are benefiting from it, it it's a little bit more obscure um, do you are you troubled by the fact that it's 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 hard to see that common interest and actually is that is that a stumbling block for the things changing for you know uh, you know some of the wealth to be redistributed around this i don't, I don't think any uh, understanding of uh, class interest ever comes naturally uh, because it's the thing that makes you a class is very abstract. It's kind of harder to see than the way uh, systems of race and gender work very much through sort of regimes of how you appear in the world. Class is a little different and obviously there's a ruling class with a you know massive interest in us not perceiving a class interest and also in not perceiving that as digital workers we share a lot of common interests with analog workers you know, with, with factory workers. Like, I think our labor is kind of different. I, and, and just some ways to explain that, you know, before COVID, I, I always worked in coffee shops and being, you know, we're like an ethnographer, I'm always like looking at what's on people's screens. And it's curious, I would just see exactly the same laptops as my one with these completely different things on it. So our work makes no sense to each other at all, but all of it's through exactly the same machine. So like there's some commonality there that's sort of really obvious, yeah? Another thing about why this work is different is I don't know when I'm working and when I'm not, yeah? Like, it's like, it's not like I clock on at nine and I'm done at five and go have a drink at the pub. Like it just doesn't work like that. It's like, you know, whole days happen where I'm just sitting here doing like really nothing useful. And then there's like, three hours where I seem to get the entire works week, the entire week's work done in one go. Yeah. So it's really the opposite of factory work, but there are all these attempts by a ruling class trying to extract value from us to make this like factory work. Yeah. So like my job and a lot of other people's becomes like just clicking buttons and doing things that are measurable 
And because you can't really measure this work, they'll change the work. It's like they're changing what culture is or what knowledge is based on what they can measure and extract value from. Yeah. So like that's the worst of it. And did it, uh, did it surprise you to see that the, the people that have benefited from, uh, at least in financial terms, uh, from the, the kind of uh, financial instability around COVID have, have been the vectorless class? So, you know, Zuckerberg and uh, Jeff Bezos sort of seeing huge, um, huge gains in terms of stock market value after this period. Were you, were you surprised or did that just play into the dystopian narrative that you were expected to see unspooled? I mean, there's a way in which stock markets don't have a whole lot of collect connection to reality anyway, but there does seem to be this kind of um, transfer of wealth and power uh, to those who control the vector, particularly because we're all at home. Yeah, that's sort of part of it. Uh, so, and, and you know, I, I'm, I'm sure there are people in the audience who, who either, you know, run a small business or know people who do, it's like a truly terrible time to just stay afloat. Yeah, because you had all these outgoings and insurance and rent and all that and no customers. So my, my friends who are in small business are really kind of struggling. It makes me wonder if this happened during the um, uh, Spanish flu pandemic hundred years ago. Like, I don't know, but was there a massive transfer of wealth upwards through the uh, collapse of people's working lives in small business at that time? I kind of suspect there might've been. Uh, so that's kind of the problem is, is uh, you know, there's a ruling class that, that really like does as well out of disaster as out of things working sort of functioning but for the rest of us that's not true we kind of need the world to work uh, and be inhabitable particularly for our kids if you have them because at the moment it sort of won't be um you know i think so so that it really you know, covid really sort of presses that issue a bit uh, as to who benefits from you know vectoral power throws it all into relief um, we're going to switch gears a little bit now. Um, I promised a whistle stop tour and that's what it will be to, to someone really interesting in your book, Jackie Wang. Um, he's a, a poet and a, an academic that probably doesn't do much justice to um, the approach. But um, she recently wrote a book um, called Castle Capitalism, which I guess in one way is kind of tra struggling to reconcile a world in which she can study at Harvard while her, you know, her brother is imprisoned in Florida. Um, and amongst other things, like, it, it kind of tackles these themes around how racism is shaping, has shaped uh, the criminal justice system profoundly. But it also goes into, you know, from algorithmic policing through to the link to financial exclusion and um, how risk is calculated really around people and, uh, and, and predatory lending and how that leads to financial exclusion more broadly. So, um, I wondered if you could say a bit more about how uh, Jackie goes about connecting those dots, because that's a, a, almost in a bit of an example of what you were talking about at the beginning in terms of you know, looking at different fields, things which are normally analysed in isolation and saying, actually, no, these are all connected and we need to understand how. Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to say uh, Jackie Wang is now a colleague of mine in my department of cultural media at the, at the New School. As I, I'm, uh, what an awful time to have to start a new teaching job, but, but <laughs> I'm very happy that, that we have her. Uh, and, and that's in the section of Sensoria that's, that I called sort of ethnographic. It's sort of looking at different parts of the world. So why is this book that's very focused on the United States? I think particularly for a, a white middle class, you know, person in America like myself, that is another country. Like there is a whole, like the Gulag Archipelago is real and it's in the United States right now. Like there's an entire country inside the country of millions of incarcerated people. Well, how do people get incarcerated? Well, through uh, massive over policing, but which is now, among other things, algorithmic, uh, where uh, a whole series of sort of tools to like track and monitor uh, and decide where to arrest people is now kind of algorithmically governed. And to, you know, Jackie is talking about that. Uh, well, why why are police departments doing? you know, this kind of crazy thing where they just sort of like figure out where they're arresting people. And it's kind of like, you know, if you have a business and you figure out we're selling a lot of stuff over there, so let's go sell some more stuff over there. The, the, the policing version is we're arresting people over there, so let's go arrest more people over there. It sounds like a philanthropic prophecy. Yeah, a bit, a bit, a bit exactly because it's good business. Like the collapse of the financing of uh, public services means that, you know, in a city like Ferguson, they're arresting everybody to charge fines to pay the police. So it's like a vicious circle that kind of goes around, yeah? 
uh, we have to arrest everybody because we're broke. Um, we're broke because we spend all the money on the police and we have to use the fines to pay them. You know, it's, it's, I'm obviously simplifying and caricaturing, but there's an extent to which that's very real. Um, and that's kind of what's going on. And I suspect in parts of the UK, we're really not that different to that. Um, so yeah, I, I thought it was really important to start my sort of whistle top view, stop tour of other views of the world to start where I am in the United States. And, uh, and the uh, hook was prophetic in the sense that all this erupted again. We're, we're in the middle of um, Black Lives Matter too. Uh, and, you know, in, in terms of its media presence, this is a movement that's been going on for some time. And, and it's interesting that, isn't it? Because uh, I guess uh, the emphasis in terms of the, the coverage of Black Lives Matter and the protests have been on that kind of uh, very visceral, kind of appalling examples of police brutality. Um, but what she's tracing, again, is, is less visible because it's, um, it's about how data is handled, how people are, you know, are given parole or not, or as you say, how communities are policed. Um, and I just wonder whether or not, you know, what will we see that a, a greater interest and spotlight and scrutiny of some of those things expanding out from uh, the, the protests around Black Lives Matter? How kind of optimistic are you that it will become part of the bigger conversation or um, are, are, we, are we just looking at it through a more narrow lens? I, you know, like the, the sort of cynical take would be that, you know, it's, it's when white people perceive, you know, massive over policing is not in their interests directly, that, that you would start to see change on that. And it's a little bit what happened in a place like New York City, because there's this like giant budget crisis at the moment. Uh, and it's like, wait a minute, how much are we spending on, you know, like, uh, I have to, you know, ship school supplies to my kids' school uh, every year because they don't have pens and pads and pencils. But you know, there are police officers making more money than I do as a senior professor, right? To do what, you know? And then I'm like, I don't, you know, if you walk around New York City, you see police everywhere doing absolutely nothing. And I'd kind of rather they do nothing than a lot of what they actually do. But I'm kind of like, I'm paying for that. <laughs> I'm a taxpayer here. I'm paying for you to stand there on your phone for hours doing nothing. <laughs> you know, don't like, shout that, do you? No. Yeah, we're, we're going to be firing nurses to pay police is where we are. So I think when white people start to perceive, all right, so if I get COVID and go to a hospital and they don't have PPE and they don't have... Uh, you know, nursing staff, it's because of all the cops in the hallway standing around doing nothing. So I think at some point, you know, the sort of penny starts to drop, but that was a really good business for, you know, a handful of people, politically useful because there's a way to uh, provide employment for people who weren't sort of going to really do all that well in a knowledge-based economy. Um, but at some point, you're like, it's, it's not sustainable. So I think it's when, you know, you get a kind of coalition of interests around that is not working, that you might mm. change it. Yeah, that. and, and that, that did feel new, that kind of interest in the debate around defunding the police. And, and of course, that's what Jackie Wang does do, is she kind of, as you say, looks at how local government and policing is funded. And you've kind of got to follow the money, I guess, to yeah. understand how a lot of this, how, how power works in these contexts. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a political economy of information take on why we have policing. And that, that was really extraordinary that she did that. Yeah. Um, and so on to someone who, who's based here in London, actually, I think just up the road from me in, in Goldsmiths. So uh, Kodwo Shu. Um, so, in some ways, the, there were some things in, in this piece which felt more hopeful. So this idea that sometimes music can be a way of feeling our way forwards into the future um, when perhaps you know, language isn't there yet or um, theory isn't there yet. And um, there's this great, great quote, so everything the media warns you against has already been made into tracks that drive the dance floor. Um, so can you tell me a bit about uh, is that is that what spoke to you from his work or was it something else um, that, that kind of drew you to it? Uh, it's yeah, it's a book called uh, More Brilliant Than the Sun, which uh, was going to be reissued, but it's sort of been delayed. Uh, so like, if you can find it, it's, it's just a classic. It's, it's actually from the late 90s. Uh, and I'm sort of from that same era of, of media theory and it has this somewhat delirious, you know, kind of flavour to it that media theory used to have in those days. But Kodo's book is about uh, black music and it's about 
uh, the forward momentum of, of black music, exploring the possibility spaces of different technologies to, to kind of, to get free. Yeah, it's this, this sense that, you know, like there really isn't, uh, in the West, there isn't a past to latch onto is like a thing to return to. Uh, for people who've formerly been enslaved or, or colonized. So what does a black future look like? Uh, and there's been a lot of talk about accelerationism in the last few years, and some of which is kind of like, like very unpleasantly racist. Uh, I don't even want to deal with any of that. But what's the black perspective on, you know, looking forward rather than looking back? And this book does it and does it through music. And the first part of the book is all about, you know, aesthetic, like, you know, how do we how do we actually perceive the elephant is the thing I want to ask. And to do it a little bit through music rather than through, you know, sort of cinema or writing or whatever struck me as really helpful. And it was part of also I, I kind of um, went back to rave culture you know i'm 58 and i started going to raves again you know uh but it, like like mainly because i can't hear anybody to have a conversation in a bar or a restaurant anymore um you know i prefer to meet one-on-one -on -one for coffee or go to a rave with like 100 people where it doesn't matter that i can't hear a damn thing so it's kind of ironic but at my end it's actually a really fun way to socialize yeah and and one of the things the book does is think about um you know what is the um, kind of what is the what are the ideas what are the concepts and feelings in kind of forward thinking black dance music and it's particularly important at the moment I think to stress that uh, you know house is black music techno is black music yeah there's there's a whole massive appropriation of these things by white culture that's not where this comes from and I think we need to kind of celebrate its roots I, I, I but I'm, oh, but Koda wouldn't want me to say roots so I celebrate it it's all about the fact that, you know, it was black music that always was the thing pointing to the future, yeah? Yeah. 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 Like the, way, the way, you know, like, saxophone is an old instrument for an orchestra, but nobody knew what it could do until jazz players picked it up and went, you know what, it does all of this, you know? Here's all these things this machine will do that you didn't know, yeah? So that's, that's the thing with that one. That I kind of, it's, it's really refreshing the way uh, he takes issue with that idea of roots and authenticity and it's, you know, search for the, the, the authentic roots of something and that will tell you what it is. Um, and um, so you, you kind of passed over and I understand why uh, the, that concept of accelerationism because it is uh, very problematic and it's been co-opted in lots of weird uh, directions. Um, but it, but it is, I think, quite a counterintuitive idea, and uh, I thought it would be interesting just to just to pause on it for one minute because there is a bit of a link with some of what you're saying about capitalism, which is that um, you know a lot of the critiques of capitalism are about you know can we slow it down, can we um, resist progress and return to something better, and I think you're you're sort of saying um, in your analysis also of these these other writers that actually if we're beyond that now then we need to, we might need to push forward into something else entirely and, and make that thing better um and accelerationism is this idea that actually you know capital is always changing capitalism is always changing technology is always changing and it isn't necessarily always about restraining that sometimes you might need to go faster to to find the thing out the other end of that could you say a bit more about that yeah, and there is a, a strain in, in Marx that, that does seem accelerationist. All that is sold melts into air, all that is sacred is profane, the man is at, for, at last uh, forced to face his real relations with his kind. Like it's in the manifesto. Uh, but I think particularly after the failure of the uprisings of 1968, there's a movement in, in sort of French thought that's very much, well, we can't negate capital uh, like that movement fails, or well, what if we accelerated it to its end and got it got it over quicker? Uh, is, is a way of thinking about what uh, Lyotard Baudrillard and uh, Deleuze and Guattari were kind of doing in the 70s in the wake of 68. Uh, and there are other sort of versions of that that you then start to find. Um, J.D. Bernal in, in England was writing about this in the 20s. Uh, there's, there's a kind of, you know, there are all sorts of other accel accelerationist, mm -hmm. uh, left accelerationist sort of theories out there. Um, it kind of became something else in the uh, in the 90s that I kind of don't even want to talk about. It became like bizarrely kind of fashionable again. Um, and to me, it, it was a fairly provincial version of all of the sort of creative ferment that happened in the internet, about the internet. Like there was this net theory was a huge thing in the 90s. And that's where I met 
uh, Kodoishan, for example, uh, and, and relatively unexplored. There was like so much creative writing in theory going on at that period, not all of which ended up in these sort of versions that people now kind of pick out and anthologize. Uh, and it's, but it strikes me that one might want to think about uh, not just negation as a figure for history and acceleration, but others, like, like maybe we need different understandings of how change happens in history. And in Capitalist Dead, I made it a four part diagram. Uh, so there's the negate capitalism theory, the accelerate capitalism theory. Um, then we overlooked that uh, Jean-Paul Sartre had this really interesting one about capitalism's inertia, like why is it resistant to change? Why does it feel like we're on a, a runaway train and we can't pull the emergency brake as Walter Benjamin suggests? It's like a comedy where you, we pull the emergency brake and the thing is still going, you know, like why? There's that. Uh, so that's Critique of, Di of Dialectical Reason, a book I think is so timely to read now. Uh, about the practical inert, you know, like we build this thing over and against ourselves that we're alienated from that keeps going without us, you know. And then the fourth, I, I wanted to talk about um, what I call extrapolation, um, which I got out of Joseph Needham, who's a sort of neglected figure, but uh, one of the towering like figures in social theory in the 20th century, um, whose work's all about China, which is maybe why, you know, we don't read him so much. Uh, and he was a natural scientist, and his thing was we can't copy the forms of organization of the natural world, but we can understand how variable forms of organization are if we study the natural world. So the social isn't modeled on the natural, it's different. But from an understanding of nature, we can understand different ways of organizing and perhaps find a way to reorganize the social in relation to nature in a way that one doesn't end the other. Fascinating. So this is the kind of two minute warning uh, for questions. So please, pop them in the box right now so um, I can see them as soon as, uh, as we finish. I can already see some really interesting uh, ones have come in while we've been chatting. Um, so you talked about language, you talked about, you know, or, you know bringing in other, other concepts, other ways of, of seeing the world. Um, you were recently asked if we are living in a dystopia and um, I think it, it's interesting that you found that word limiting because it, you know, it is, it is, um, it has such kind of common currency, particularly at the moment. It's one that's constantly thrown about in the context of uh, Trump's presidency. Um, but you talked about the need for a kind of people's technology movement, and that is that's something which relates very closely to a lot of the work that we do uh, here at Nesta on um, how we can make technology and the internet more democratic, more inclusive, more inclusive. So I wonder, you know, what, what, why is that needed? What would that kind of look like? Uh, what would that draw upon were it to, to take form? And then we'll, we'll head into some questions. Yeah, and there are precedents for that that we tend to forget. In the 20s and 30s in the UK, it was the social relations of science movement, uh, which is a sort of broad coalition of uh, progressive forces, from, from sort of moderate liberals to, to commies, you know, that was sort of looking at, you know, what would a people's science be? Uh, and, and that was a movement that got suppressed by the Cold War. And it's sort of just, you know, like not really a thing that we connect back to, but I think it was like hugely important and a thing sort of worth trying to revive, yeah? Uh, and, and one that was very much uh, <clears throat> involved in its leadership people from the sciences. So it was not an anti-science thing at all. Uh, nor was it a science is fine, leave us alone kind of movement. It was scientists reaching out to try to ask, well, yeah, like if we're to be citizens, uh, you know, what is the citizen scientist's role? And I think we lost that a bit. Uh, and, you know, that was very much at the beginnings of modern physics and chemistry, but uh, there were movements around um, more the sort of engineering and labor side, like the Lucas Aerospace Plan. There was a sort of uh, radical engineering movement in the 70s. Lucas Aerospace was gonna close and the engineers and workers got together and said, you know what, we could make really useful things. We have all these skills. Like, why are we making things that people actually want with the technologies we have? You know, like, it seems like an obvious question, right? Uh, and and I, I just a little bit to the, the sort of social movements of the 90s around uh, what could the internet be? And, and you know, I was kind of, in, peripherally involved in all that and like we really thought the internet could be great and it, but it wasn't about sort of some natural property of the internet there was this other argument at the time that it would be naturally democratizing that seemed kind of crazy to me 
mm. it just seemed more that it had potentials. And I think we won a couple of battles and then we lost the war. Like it became a kind of mass information extraction surveillance system instead, yeah? But it's not what it necessarily had to be, yeah? Like internet was invented in universities by academics and scholars as ways to share knowledge, yeah? Mm. Um, it really could have been built out as that rather than as this. So I kind of really think we need to return to that. And it's really encouraging to see tech workers themselves start to organize around that and start to ask those questions themselves, starting with questions about why are we making technologies for policing and surveillance and for, for ICE, you know, for the, uh, the border people in the United States. Yeah, they don't want to do that. They want to make things that, you know, like maybe you do get into engineering to, you know, like make a living and all that, but a lot of people do it because it's just pleasurable, beautiful stuff to build but then it gets used for this, you know? So I think that's kind of key is just like connect up uh, social movements around, around use with also those who have the skills and, and make it uh, as part of like, that's where the world is now constituted, yeah? Um, it's, it's not as if the political realm is where real decisions are made, like technology is where those decisions are made. So the, the critique has to start from kind of within the belly of the beast as well. Um, so I uh, so had some really good questions coming in and please do share more. Um, it's one that um, I'm uh, selfishly going to choose because I wanted to ask it because um, I think it's an interesting frame, framing, but um, didn't, didn't have time. So um, Chelsea is, is wondering about the, the origins of Sensoria as a, as a title and what that meant to you. Oh, thank you, Chelsea. <laughs> um, there was there was actually going to be a book in Australia in the 90s with that title. It never happened that I think I was a contributor to. I might have been an editor of it. I don't really remember. And then I proposed it as a title for a book uh, for Pluto Press Australia, uh, like 25 years ago, and it went into a catalog. And so it would show up on Amazon as a book I'd already written because it got into a forward catalog when it shouldn't have. So it was always like just there. Like I have looked up my own stuff on Amazon to see how many stars I get, that sort of stuff. And they'd be like, uh, oh, this is one I never wrote. Yeah, so I was like, okay, I should actually do the book that's got that title to fix that problem. That's like the dumb answer for where it came from. But uh, in relation to the, the material in the book, it's, it's kind of like to, to highlight the relationship of the sensory to the cognitive, yeah? And to think the, uh, that we live in a, you know, the way I'm using the word is we live in a sensoria uh, that's now mediated, that's now kind of, you know, partially or substantially kind of digital. Uh, so the book is organized in three parts. And the first is aesthetics. How do we understand the form in which we are sensing is to me what aesthetics does. Also media theory, I do actually highlight my own discipline. I got a cop to that. Then the second part of the book is to descender that away from, in my case, a sort of New York white person view of the world to see there are other sensorias. And then the third part of the book is like, what's the technical infrastructure that makes all of that actually happen? Can we get down to that sort of level and see how that is producing these different worldviews, these different sensorias that we all perceive? So that's sort of like the architecture of the book and hence the word. And that leads us very nicely into uh, a question uh, that comes from Khalid and, um, and and it seems to me kind of a question that you're asking yourself. I'm not sure how, how easily you found an answer, but this is um, the question of, you know, what is the role of the people who design these digital systems when it comes to leading us into something newer, something different for the hacker class? What, what should they be doing? Yeah, that's a really key question. And, and there is a kind of uh, danger in only thinking through the kind of uh, design mindset. Uh, like it's one that I, I really kind of value. Like the, the new school is also Parsons School of Design. It's one of the biggest design schools in the world. And I kind of love working with my design colleagues, but they do have a range of ways of of doing things. And, and one thing that comes up a lot is they're looking for solutions. Like they treat something as a problem for which they can have, find a solution, yeah? And then you do it and you move on. Uh, and it's like, you know, if you're the people being solved, that's not actually how it works. 
So how do you put those ways of thinking in conversation with others sort of then becomes the question to ask, yeah? So I, I think it's really key that people who have uh, design or engineering or information science roles, uh, you know, look to their colleagues, like talk with colleagues about what they're doing, uh, think about how else it could be done, but also to sort of see that as not necessarily the sovereign discourse in relation to all the others. So there are other kinds of knowledge that other pieces of how you build things or also more important, and I think the designers don't think about so much how you maintain things, uh, you know, so that we're sort of building a world that's equitable and sustainable. Yeah, and, and as you kind of say, part, part of the problem often is that we, you know, we simply don't understand how things are made or designed when we're critiquing them. And so we have to kind of go with a degree of humility to colleagues, to others who do understand and say, okay, I need to, I need to figure this out. And that's kind of part of, guess, the project of your, of your book. Um, we've got an interesting question about the um, coalitions of interest between climate movements and labour movements. So how can uh, art and, and knowledge exchange between climate movements and labour movements help kind of facilitate that, that kind of common interest and connection? Is that something uh, you've got, got thoughts on? Yeah, and, and you know, I, I attempted to be a political activist in my 20s and found out I was really terrible at it, so I became a writer instead. So I'm, I'm never the person really to ask questions about uh, political strategy. And, and it's like, why writers think they would have an answer to that? Like, the thing we're good at is sitting alone with our computer, right? <laughs> like, if you're a writer, you're really probably not a people person. So that's the caveat that I really want to stress there. Uh, but, but I think there is a kind of a, a, a cognitive piece to it that I can pull out is that the, the problem in relation to labour with climate change is that you have to sort of talk about what the potential thing we could be working on is as opposed to the thing our labour actually does. Like that's sort of the leap, yeah? Uh, because there's a lot of kinds of labour that people depend on to make a living that is sort of destroying the world. Uh, so how do you sort of create a vision of some other work you could be doing. Uh, like there are, there are entire states in, you know, um, northern United States and Canada now sort of propped up by shale oil, yeah? Uh, or, or, you know, Alaska also is, is kind of heavily oil-based. And it's like, you can't really get a lot of traction there with a climate change argument because you're telling people that they would, are the ones who would have to sacrifice for it to happen. So it's like, what's the other vision? What's the other thing you could do that is labor that you might want? Um, that's not that then becomes the crucial piece. So uh, the, the question I mentioned, the role of art, broadly speaking, that's kind of what that is, is to kind of create that vision. Because it's like, yeah, you can make a living doing this, but your kids not so much. So is that what you really want? Interesting. And um, I think potentially a very kind of politely phrased question, but I wonder if it's a bit of a challenge. So um, Emilio is asking about um, the, the relationship between the so-called attention economy and a project like the one you've been engaged in. So with General Intellects and Sensoria, which are giving kind of brilliant outlines on different thinkers. Um, Emilio is asking, is, is that then the role of the philosopher these days to kind of help mediate between different disciplines and kind of interpret? Uh, yeah, that's actually kind of interesting. Like there, there was this um, model, it's, you know, and it's, the, it's, it's Hegel and the, the sort of Hegelian interpretations of Marx that there's a kind of sovereign discourse that's kind of theoretical uh, and that there's a kind of, um, conceptual sovereign knowledge over all the others that will assign the places to all the others uh, and shows why all the others are partial. Or in the Althusserian version, it's the role of philosophy to show how knowledge should be constructed and when it's not constructed properly. So there were attempts in philosophy, I think, to have a sovereign role. And I, I dispute that claim. I don't think philosophy can have a sovereign role at all. I mean, in a, yet a third version is, is philosophy is the sort of, if you like, debugging of the code of language and showing the limits to what language can do. So you know, sort of all these versions that where philosophy tries to claim a role of sovereignty for itself. Uh, and what we, it, I think it'd be more interesting to kind of think of philosophy as a minor discipline. Uh, and maybe what it does is interstitial. It's ways of trying to find what the relation between concepts in different conceptual fields could possibly be. 
Uh, so what would that what would that be? And I think that maps a little bit with um, what actually happened to philosophy in uh, the structure of the university. Like a lot of particularly continental philosophy is based on this premise that the kind of sovereign role of philosophy that the German university assigned it, you know, like centuries ago is still there and it's sort of not. Yeah, there's this sort of like power side to philosophy claiming to legislate when it sort of doesn't actually do that. So it kind of seems just practical politics to think of a different role for that, particularly in an era when the fields of knowledge so vastly expanded that, you know, like I say, you can't be Hegel in, in 2020. Yeah, like Hegel's physics is terrible. Like nobody even reads it because it's wrong. You know, like he couldn't even do it then, but like how do you possibly claim a synthetic role in relation to the fields we now have? I don't even understand the fields adjacent to my own, you know, let alone what's going on in the physics lab. Um, and a, a kind of, a, a, again, another sort of challenge, which I think you probably encounter fairly often, which is, um, Caroline's asking, you know, why, why look to Marxism in the digital age as a framework? Surely, you know, are there not other frameworks we should, should be using? Um, and I think you're, you're pretty uh, trenchant in your defense of, uh, of, of why, why, why we have to at least start with Marx to understand where we came from. Is that fair? Yeah, and, and it's like there'd be a couple of answers to that, and and one would be, well, show me the other ones. You know, like it, it's sort of it's it's a kind of rich and uh, varied tradition that uh, that did come out of the academy and did attempt and it kind of failed to reorganize the world several times over. So yeah, it's it's, it's big. Like it still is the untranscended horizon of of modern thought, to paraphrase Sartre. Yeah, uh, I have I have a personal uh, loyalty. Loyalty is maybe not the the right word, but solidarity with the uh, working class militants who trained me in the 70s. Uh, so I, I personally, you know, will not betray the, the comrades who have passed. Uh, so it's partly a personal thing. Uh, as partly it does actually work. It's like incredibly flexible and open and has, has been with us for two centuries and is global. It's, it's a global discourse. Uh, the, the way uh, the Chinese think what Marxism is is completely different to the Latin American versions, but there, there's a language that allows you to navigate between them and a shared history. So yeah, it's like, uh, what else you got, you know? And I, I kind of feel like the attempts to replace it by kind of Cold War liberalism didn't really work very well. And we're basically Marxists, you know? Like the alternatives were written by Marxists who changed sides in the 20th century, yeah? Uh, like your know, Daniel Bells and uh, Rostos and uh, even even Alvin Toffler, you know, was, was trained as a socialist, you know. So yeah, you know, like just show me what else you got. It seems to work for me, you know. Uh, and it doesn't actually, it doesn't actually imply a political choice. Like, no, like they're, they're right wing Marxists, you know. So it's a thing. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's what that's what's interesting. And it's um, you know, I hope they don't throw you out the club for saying that capitalism is over, you know. And, uh, <laughs> It's, um, oh, I am, I'm already excommunicated oh, by me. Okay. But, but that's another thing. There used to be a party that legislated on on whether you whether it was orthodox or not. Now there isn't. Like, who are right. we kidding? Like, it's now an open discourse. You know? Um. So we're we're nearly in the last few minutes, and that's absolutely flown by. And um, one one question we started to discuss last time we spoke was, um, you know, that this book was, I think you know, there is a mention of COVID in the introduction, but must have been written, you know, in the main and gone through the publication process before our, our world was turned upside down. So I just wonder kind of who have you been reading? Who have you been turning to, to make sense of, of, of the way that the world looks right now and the way that you're experiencing it. Is there anyone either in the volume or um, perhaps perhaps not who, who you recommend we think about? Oh, and, <laughs> and it's, it's, yeah, I sort of snuck the, the paragraph about COVID in at the very last copy edit. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a book that, that sort of predates that a lot. Um, I do think there's authors that I discuss in there who have like a lot of super interesting things to say. Uh, Achille and Bembe uh, talking about uh, African political cultural systems. It's like, oh my God, that's Trump's America. Uh, is basically a failed colonial state at this point uh, or something like it. So yeah, I, I think I found people who actually sort of really address the present. Uh, 
like a lot of trans women, I have a talent for dissociation. So I've just been pretending it's not happening in my head. You know, I think that's an yeah. ability that I have. So I'm not a good person to ask. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really loving um, Sadia Hartman's book at the moment. It's Wayward Girls and something else. I can't, I'm not going to remember the title. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But it's the, the beauty of reading that at the moment is it's, um, it's about what is the uh, sort of creative tools of survival of, uh, you know, sort of gender non-conforming, uh, aberrant, uh, you know, like wayward girls as they were called by people trying to control them. But what was their lives uh, is the thing that she's trying to write. And that's one thing I think we could really do with more of at the moment is like what are the what's the energy and creativity of, of lives we don't know that remain undocumented mm -hmm. that are only ever surveilled from above like what is their uh, kind of integrity uh, and vitalism from below uh, and that's a book mostly about um, young black women but I think that's a, a point of view you could take in a lot of different directions for example in in the neighborhood where I live which is um, uh, northern queens in in new york city uh you know it's it's more than half non-native english speakers most of whom are hispanic it's all service workers who've been like hugely hit by covid yeah uh and often living you know like where i'm four people in a little apartment and it feels like we're crowded there's people living 12 to that amount of space yeah uh, so the, the number of people who've died is, is truly astonishing. And who is, who is documenting those lives and telling those stories of the struggles those people had? That's the thing I really want to pay attention to at the moment. So, yeah, reading hidden lives and um, the tools of creative resistance. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, that that's more than enough food for thought for a Tuesday lunchtime. Um, Thank you so much for those excellent questions, everyone. And if you want to um, join some of the events uh, in, of, of this series that are coming up next, then you can kind of sign up on our website. So we've got um, Shannon Valor on uh, moral debt in technology from Edinburgh Futures Institute. And we've got Lord Tim Clement Jones on AI and education coming up too. Um, if you want to grab a copy of uh, Mackenzie's latest book, Sensoria, then there's a discount code for you in, um, in Nesta's event confirmation email. So do, do use that. Um, so really, it's just for me to pass my warmest thanks to Mackenzie for today, for getting up early in, in New York to do this. And for reminding us, I guess, to kind of build the links between specialisms, between disciplines, so, so important. Um, so goodbye to all of you. And thank you again, Mackenzie, and we hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you, Celia. Thanks. Thank you, everybody.